this past Sunday, just a little bit. Some would say it looks a little, uh, a little bit back, uh, uh, back to a little more uh, normalcy for us. But I thought, uh, I thought it uh, worked out great for Sunday. And uh, and anytime you mix uh, food with fellowship and friends, man, that's just a spectacular day. So we had an awesome, awesome uh, day and. Uh, before service this evening, uh, brother uh, brother McGar texted me to let me know they were out of town celebrating a birthday, and I told him, "Wow, that's just quite convenient. <laughs> Come in here throwing shade all over everybody, and then MIA. I mean, what's the deal here? Huh? I mean, man up, right?" <laughs> That brother McCarr, uh, he, uh, he outdid himself and all of us wound up feeling like we've been uh, uh, wrung out and, and uh, in a good and joyful way that uh, we can say that, uh, that God has blessed us to have a family and be able to bless, blessed us to be able to have fun together and be able to laugh together and be able to laugh at each other and ourselves. I don't ever want to see this again. <laughs> you had to be here to understand what I'm talking about. It got good. Why don't we stand this evening and let's just, uh, why don't we just uh, give the Lord a, a round of applause, just a little bit of waking up for us. Why don't we welcome the Lord in this place? Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, God. Truly, you're good to us. We love you, we give you glory and honor.
and we will be working with TCG girls, ages five to eight. We can't wait. Hi, I'm Faith. I'm Erica. We're working with TCG ages nine to eleven, and we are so excited to hang out with you guys. Hi, this is Lexi. Hi, this is Amber. We're working with ages twelve to eighteen on TCG girls, and we're so looking forward to getting started. season I like for the special things to really come out right it wouldn't it be great for the Lord just to meet every one of these needs just uh, all at one time he could he could yeah. do that all at one time and say okay here's healing for all of these names we, we're calling in every single uh, person so why don't we uh, just take a moment together can we stand and if you have a need that is in your life You may not even feel comfortable in, in uh, telling your neighbor, telling your friend, putting it up as a request before the church. But you know what? As we mix our faith together, the Lord hears each and every name. He hears each and every need. He hears everything that we have. He wants to do something about it. Let's give it to Him. Let Him touch us tonight. Jesus, we love You. We thank You. We praise You, God. We pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts, touch our minds. Minister, Lord Jesus, to our spirits. We pray right now, God, that you would touch in a special way, that you would help right now. Lord, every single person, God, that has a disease, every single person that has a sickness, oh Lord, we know that you are the healer. We know, God, that you are the way maker, and that you, God, can work in every situation. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to intervene. We ask you, God, to minister touch each and every life, for we love you, God. We thank you, Lord. We praise your wonderful name. Jesus, we give you glory, honor, and praise this night. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sister Faith has been having some, uh, some uh, allergic attacks that uh, have just gotten a little more prevalent. We want the Lord to touch her life, minister to her in a special way. So tonight, however you may feel comfortable, we know we have some of our young ladies surrounding her, but we'd like for you just to stretch your hand forward, and we're going to pray for her individually and specially that God will touch and minister to her life. Jesus, we love you. We praise you, God. We want you, Lord Jesus, to touch in a special way. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just making a, a real quick announcement uh, for our young people. Uh, AYC, which is Alabama Youth Conference, is going to be at the end of January. It's on the 29th and 30th. Y'all get excited about that. Uh, parents, I know your question is going to be how much does it cost. It's going to be an overnight trip. And we've estimated the cost are going to be about $85 per kid, per child, per young person, for old people too. Um, we're looking forward to going to that. And I know... Um, Hyphen folks, you may want to go. I think Brother Cam and I can coordinate as far as if anybody wants to go, if y'all want to ride with the church van or something like that. So y'all uh, look forward to that. I just wanted to put it in the parents' hearts and minds so that y'all get $85 less of Christmas present this year so that you can go to AYC. So, praise the Lord. The, 80, the $85 includes hotel registration, and food. So know that. Basically all expenses in. If you want to send them with a little spending money because they want to get a snack, do so. But $85. Woo! Woo! <laughs> and youth, youth can follow me. We're released. <laughs> all right. Youth class. They have uh, been having a... Uh, Great time in there, and uh, got a good, good group going on, and uh, things have been uh, have been a lot of fun for them. Come in the other night, and they were they were having a, a blast back there, and uh, having a, a Christmas party of sorts for for the end of the year. So. Uh, to all of our guests uh, tonight, we uh, we welcome you and uh, thank you for being with us on a, on a Wednesday evening. And uh, we are grateful that you are worshiping with us. We're going to be uh, starting a new a new series tonight, and so uh, so we've got uh, got some new stuff going on. We are in the middle of a new discipleship uh, project, and. Uh, and our first series is going to be a blessed and privileged people a series. And our lesson tonight is going to be focused on our riches in Christ. Our riches in Christ. And so our scripture focus is Ephesians, the first chapter. And the 17th verse. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Tonight we are, we are looking and focusing on our riches in Christ. Can we ask the Lord to be with us tonight? Jesus, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. We ask you, God, to minister to our hearts and souls and help us, God, once again. For we know, God, that you have been good to us. We give you glory, honor, and praise this day. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Our riches in Christ. Now, anytime you say riches around Christmas time, that always sounds good, right? <laughs> There was, there was a man that uh, was a very frightening type of creature to some that would see him. He lived in the country of the uh, Gadarenes, and uh, this, this area was a, an area that um, uh, was uh, unique and different, and it was technically a part of Israel, but it was mostly inhabited by non-Jews. And yet, um, 
we, we look and understand that Jesus went there to minister. He specifically set sail. He specifically went across uh, to um, this place. So no sooner than Jesus stepped upon out of the boat than this wild man approached him. And he was, he was quite the character, much much uh, noise, much ado, much ranting and screaming, and and uh, as, as the Bible would state that uh, this this poor fellow was one that was possessed by the devils, not a devil, but by devils, cast uh, cast out of the town, he was forced to live among the tombs. It was there that that these, uh, these people feared him so much because of, of, uh, of his extremities and, and what he uh, showed of his persona. And, uh, and in his stead, they had tried many times to stop him. Maybe they were trying in their way to help him, however it was, but they would try to bind him with shackles and chains, but it was of no use. It seemed as though the, the, uh, the demons that had possessed him gave him some kind of supernatural strength. They simply could not keep him bound, no matter what. Amen. Day and night he, 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 he roamed through the tombs and the, and the mountainsides and oftentimes screaming in torment and uh, making making much ado. His condition was, was so miserable that quite often he even caused himself harm. He, he literally would cut himself with stones. And, uh, and this is, uh, as we know, it's not something that's normal. It's something that, that we would want to take care of ourselves. But, but he was so miserable that he would do this. It, it is likely that, that uh, everyone, whenever Jesus stepped off the boat, uh, he was probably the only one that walked toward him. Everyone else was probably headed in a different direction. You see, while they were trying to escape this guy that seemed so crazed, Jesus just walked straight towards him. You see, when the demon speaking through this helpless creature challenged Jesus, he, he, he did not hesitate. He did not hesitate at all. Jesus just cast out the demons and, uh, and allowed them to enter a uh, herd of swine. And uh, there the, 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 the pigs just headed right off the cliff and plunged to their own death. That, that's pretty extreme measures that this man was possessed with. Amen. Right? Yes, sir. Whenever it could uh, affect uh, God's creation in, in this kind of way. The townspeople, seeing what Jesus had done, all of a sudden, you know, they were afraid of this man possessed by devils. They had absolutely no power and could not do anything to help him or correct the situation. Jesus walked up and spoke to him. Now their fear changed. All of a sudden they went from fearing the man that was demon possessed to fearing the man that had power over demons. Amen. Like what has happened here? And, and it was, it was uh, so much uh, uh, so that they were, they were so extreme uh, in, in, in him being able to do this to this demon-possessed madman. But all of a sudden we see and understand that he was one of those first and boldest of evangelists. According to Luke 8 and 39, he went his way and published throughout the whole city. You see, this, 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 this possessed man, he, he wanted to go with Jesus then. He wanted to follow him. I, let me go with you. I want to look what you've done for me. I will do whatever it is. I, I'll be whatever it is you need me to be. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And, and he just strictly told him, here, this is what I need you to do. I need you to stay right here. Right where you're at and tell everyone. Yes. Right. Tell everyone about what's happened in your life. Yes. Tell everyone about the change. Tell everyone about the situation. He became, just as he was uh, quite 
crazed at being a madman, I believe he, he decided if he could be that crazy with a, with, a, with a demon, that he could be that excited about what God had done for him. And he would tell everybody. I don't believe there was anybody he would leave out. I don't think there was anybody that was within his earshot that he, that he said, nah, I'll catch them another day. I think he said, you know what, if that's, if that's what you want of me, I'm going to do whatever it is. You see, over and over, we see this pattern repeated in Scripture and in history that those that have been greatly blessed by God are often greatly motivated to share that blessing with others. Yes. Now, I have told you guys that I, I do not quite understand why we've discounted our, uh, our witness for a second generation. Right. I'll let that sink in. But it seems like these guys are excited about what God's done for them. Right. But by the time a second, third generation, but well, yeah, well, you know. Right. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. You see, we forget what's happened. And that's why I've, I've reminded my children so many times that my father was not raised in this. My mom was a backslider. I stand today as a second generation honoring them because to me, their testimony is my testimony and it has not diminished. It has not changed. And I've got to be just as motivated for that to be a part of my life. If I allow their testimony to get stale and to ruin, my testimony gets stale and ruined. Right, right, right. All of a sudden, we're not as motivated. You see, the Bible tells us that as the children of God, we have a rich inheritance. For just as a just a moment, think about you and your family. Not, not just me speaking of mine, but think of, of you and your family. Whether you are a, a parent, a child, or whoever it is that you are sitting here tonight, you can understand the, the desire to, to uh, have a blessing and have an enriched family life. Parents quite often strive so diligently to give their children the best and ensure that they have everything that they need to be successful in life. If as, as, as parents we can go to such great lengths for the ones that we love, that we want to do everything we can to meet all of their needs, how much more does our Heavenly Father desire to bless us as Matthew 7 and 11 tells us? You see, we are blessed because we are a chosen people. Maybe, maybe you have not uh, uh, come from a, 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 a family unit that you feel is very strong. Maybe, maybe you've, you've come to the church and, and you've come here individually and you've come without, without a, a family unit. But even so, you can see from, from, from afar just how much God has, has done in your life and where He's brought you to to have a church family as you have. You see, He saw you in your hurt, your struggle, your pain, your, your tears, your brokenness. He saw you in there. He felt that, that, that He could help you. And He, he, he was reaching to, to us wherever we was, were at, however far away we felt like we were. It, he was closer than what we realized. You see, God saw this, this great, incredible gap that sin creates between us and Him. Right. And you see, no matter what, second generation, guess what? You're still a sinner. Right. Amen. You still got to have your sins paid for. Right. Amen. Third generation, guess what? Come on. Right. You see, there is no freebies. No, sir. There is no way of slide into heaven. If you're sliding, it's usually got a back in front of you. There's no free way into heaven. He paid the price for every person's sins. He didn't pay the price for our parents. He didn't pay the price for our grandparents. And therefore, we got an automatic pass. He pays the price for every person's sins. Right. And every single one of us have to have that relationship with Him. You see, God saw that, that gap and, and He did not leave us to struggle with, with those, but He came to us. He manifested Himself 
in flesh and became that sacrifice that would bridge the gap and to draw us closer to Him. John 12 reminds us that, that if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. The work of Calvary was to, to draw you to God. That's what that work was. So how does knowing you are, a, are, you are chosen by God affect your attitude toward God? Think about that for a moment. Does it make you want to honor Him more? Does it make you feel that you're in a position of gratefulness? Knowing that you could not purchase any on your own, but that you have been chosen and God chose you to have a part in this glorious gospel. You see, God has blessed us by giving us a purpose. When the word blessed is used in Old Testament reference uh, to God, it's referring to His covenant relationship with His people. Genesis 9, 24, Psalm 41, Isaiah 61. The word is used eight times in reference to God in New Testament scriptures. Mark 14, Luke 1, Romans 1, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, Ephesians 1, 1 Peter 1. Each time it means that God is to be praised for His faithfulness in keeping the covenant. Yes. Nice. So in other words, if He made the covenant, in the New Testament He reinforces it that He is a covenant keeper. Yes. Right. He reinforces it that before there was a group, He was the first promise keeper. Huh. He was the one that was first faithful. He was the one that was first there to be a spiritual blessing to us, giving us the knowledge that He will honor us with His promises and that His promises will never fail. They did not diminish from one testament to the next. Right. Right. They're still forever settled. Old Testament, we see that those those chosen people were the Jews. No one, no one else could, could actually access the promises of, and God's heritage at that time. But through Jesus Christ, the covenant was expanded to the Gentiles. And there we are called the chosen people of God. And to what purpose have we been chosen? God has chosen the church to help fulfill that eternal purpose. Yes, we've been chosen in salvation. Yes, that is true. But what more? We are chosen also to join Him in the work of trying our best to help Him save humanity. Have you thought about your life's purpose? So what do you think your purpose is? What is your reaction to being chosen by God specifically for a purpose? You see, we are here to help spread the gospel. Take a survey. Of the last 90 days, how much has the gospel been spread? Take a survey of the last 60 days, of the last 30 days, of the last 7 days. How much of the gospel has been spread? You see, God has blessed us and enabled us to live a new life. We come to, 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 to mind uh, 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 quite often when we talk about this new life and Him, him speaking of us as, as, uh, as priests, as, as royalty in New Testament Scripture. When we think of that, you see, what, what happens whenever we bring that word royalty to mind? You see, many people expect members of royalty to conduct themselves differently than common people. Even those in royal families expect a higher standard of those in their own family. They raise their children to certain expectations. They tell their children there are certain activities that they will partake in and certain things they will not partake in. Why? Because they're royalty. But what if one day you suddenly are adopted into a royal family? That would it raise your expectations? 
of what you would be and what you would do. You see, you and everyone around you, you would, you would expect something a little differently. Being a member of the royal family that you have not been a part of, but all of a sudden you're allowed to be a part of it. Wouldn't you think that, that you would be grateful in those things and wanting to do so much? You see, the same is true for us in, in being brought into God's royal family. We are given riches beyond words when we are accepted into God's kingdom. We are we expected to live a new and a different life. And we, we are, are given the power of God's Spirit to help us to be able to do so. Yeah. God values us so much that He's purchased us with His very own blood. Something we could not do on our own. Our rescue from sin by the blood of Jesus is not complete until we allow our lives to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ Himself. We understand as royalty, it's not that you're trying to be the best person you can be. I know we all try to say that. I want to be the best I can be. No, you don't. That's not your goal. Your goal is to be more like Him every day. Your goal is not to be the best you can be. That's a world value. A godly value is I want to be more like Him every day. That's something I can reach for. That's something I can try my best to, to put. You see, that is our mark. If you want to, we talk about standards in, in church quite often. You want to know your, your, you want to know your first standard? Standard number one. Be the expression of the image of Christ. If you get that standard right, you ain't got a problem with any others. Right, right. It, it does not matter what, 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 what the rest of them are. Right. If we get number one right. You see, that's our highest mark. That's our highest standard. That is the one that we, we, we look to within our life. Not only do we have a rich inheritance as God's children, but, but the Bible tells us that God wants to reach all people with His love. He has gone to great lengths for His children to provide them with, with the spiritual riches and blessings. You see, he has, he has, He's done everything for us to be able to escape from sin and to be able to, to walk into holiness. It's one, something that He gives to us. 2 Corinthians 6 and 18 and uh, will be a father unto you and you shall be sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He calls us His children and the house of God, made up both of Jews and of Gentiles, according to Ephesians 1 and 5. What that we have the adoption of children. Do we understand that New Testament, we've been adopted into this. In other words, we are part of His royal heritage and we've been purchased in. We've been allowed to be there. As Gentiles, I don't know why we struggle so much with some things and trying to be the children of God whenever He's opened a door to us. Right. right. That we are privileged to be here. Right. We might need to act like it a little more sometimes. Amen. Right. Our world today, the attitude of the world is, God, you're privileged to have me at your house. Right. Mm. Come on, that's the truth. Right. That's the spirit of the world. Right? right? Mm -hmm. Which is totally opposite of the spirit of God. That's right. right. Spirit of God, as you've been adopted into this, how many times have you ever seen the beauty of one of those relationships of some poor little child that was out there all alone and all of a sudden adopted into a family and brought in and given everything and all the cherished uh, moments of a family and care that a family receives? That is an awesome thing. Put you in that category with that picture. That's who we are as the children of God. We don't belong here, but we have made it here. We don't belong here, but because of those rejecting Him, we've been given that chance. We've had that open door. I want to make the best of my opportunity. Right. Amen. You see, children have a very interesting way sometimes of viewing the world, and, and, and they are at certain levels of innocence in the in the in the small children. You see, they're 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 not encumbered with doubt, and they trust. Mm -hmm. You see, because they because they really they don't suffer from bitterness. Right. Right. 
They enjoy a general feeling of contentment when their basic needs are met. Right. Come on. Just the basics of life. Right. I mean, you think about a child. There's just not a lot whenever it comes there. I mean, hey, feed me, clean me, feed me, clean me, feed me. <coughs> it's two of the basics, right? Cuddle me up, cuddle me up, rock me. Things is pretty simple. That's right. Right? But you take care of those basic needs and there's such contentment <coughs> that those children have. You see, children have a remarkable ability to forgive the unforgivable. And they know how to work the work of reconciliation. Have you ever seen two children that was having a knockdown drag out one day? And 15 minutes later. Yeah. <laughs> huh? After they've got all the tears all wiped away and all that, right? Hey, you want a popsicle? <laughs> huh? Th Think about it for a moment. And how many of us adults? Come on. I can do it. 15 minutes later. Are ready to say, okay, we're good. How about a popsicle? <laughs> you see, most children, they, they are unscathed by that burden of fear and they they are, are still so so full of wonder. So can you think of a time whenever you, you needed your parent or individual to, to care for you and you, you approached that individual knowing that this source would have the, the solution to what you needed and, and at the level of expectation if you wanted, uh, you would receive that. If it was food, you would be fed. If it was that you were ill, that, that you would be comforted. Guess what? The Lord wants us to approach Him the same exact way. Right. He wants us to know that He is there for us and that He wants to be all there is and we need to let Him know He will not only exceed the expectations set by our earthly parents, but He will exceed those. He will even be a father to the fatherless. Yes. The ones that does not have anyone to care for them. He will be that father. He will go beyond and show them. You see, this is our God. So how would you describe the level of urgency God feels about His lost children? What's the urgency He would have? No, it's unbearable. You see, we understand that God has provided salvation through our faith in Jesus Christ. There is a name that is higher than all others. There's no other name given among men, right? Higher than, than every principality and power and higher with all might and dominion. And his, his name is to be exalted and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are buried in His name in baptism. We are resurrected by the power of His name. At the name of Jesus, demons tremble and sickness is defeated. At the name of Jesus, the sting of death is robbed and the grave it loses its grip. You and I today, the Lord, He is wanting to reign. He begins to reveal. He begins to reveal Himself. And our spiritual eyes are opened. And, and we are no longer in darkness. But all of a sudden, we're, we're in His marvelous light. We're coming to His marvelous light. And we understand more fully the riches that we have in Christ Jesus. If there's one thing that the generational uh, uh, curse has got to be able to have, it's got to be able to see the richness of their heritage. The richness of their inheritance. Right. You Amen. see, the same grace that, that God had, he, he, has, he has given to, to allow us to find that new life. Sin marred the first creation, but, but grace restored what was lost. And now we are that new creation in Christ. I like this, Brother Brian Kinsey put together. It says, there is no price that can be put on God's mercy. God saw the value and He knew the cost. He sacrificed Himself for us, forever making it known that no cost is too great to redeem a lost and dying world. Right. Amen. 
to what extent would he go for a lost child? To what extent? So have you experienced that saving power of Jesus in your life? We need to share it if we've experienced it. Right. Amen. You see, when we understand our place in God's family, we will want to reach others. You see, this desire comes as the Holy Ghost reveals Christ in us. The Spirit grants us wisdom, the, the wisdom that comes from spiritual truths leading us into, into Christ. We know that, that in, in, in this revelatory time, that, that this revelation is moving deep from God, leading us in understanding that only He can give. God's gifts are, are, are connected to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The more you know about Jesus, the more you will understand about the Word of God. The, more, the deeper you dig into the Word of God and you start seeing Jesus, then all of a sudden you are going to be able to see things differently because you will not just be looking through your eyes, you will be looking through His eyes. When we read the Word of God as if we really know Jesus, the mind of Christ. You see, this, this spiritual insight helps us to identify God's purpose for us in this world too. You see, the Holy Ghost provides us with gifts and abilities, the things that are needed, and it is there for us to be able to rule in God's kingdom. God uses the church, and that is those who are in Christ, to help rescue those lost souls. Amen. You see, after being rescued from sin, we're equipped to... To, to have the power to rule. Yes. For those of us who, who have had our spiritual eyes open, we know and we understand in part, according to the Word of God, right? You know in part, according to, to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. We're not just going to know in part, but, but it is that we have a unique position in being able to, to see that there is those that are spiritually blind. blind. Amen. There are those that consider themselves spiritual, but, but they need an awakening. They need more of God's Word. They need more of the openness of who Jesus is in their life. It's one thing just to confess Christ. It's another thing to know Him. It's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus. We can find 70% of our world that says, I believe in Jesus. Amen. doesn't mean they're serving Jesus. Just means they believe in Jesus. The closer we get to Jesus and the closer we get to Him, He died for a world. Do you think that He would just be saying, well, yeah, maybe I will. We'll talk about it next time. No, He wants every single soul saved. He died for every single person. He wants every single person to experience the power of God. If we will look through those eyes, if our eyes have been opened, there are times that we're going to say, I'm not going to do that because of what they will see of me. Amen. Because it's our witness. How can I bring them Christ? How can I show them Christ? How can I be the image of Christ? Or will I just confess Christ? There's a difference. Amen. There's a big difference in between confessing Christ and expressing Christ. Amen. Amen. Our world needs the church to get back to expressing Christ. And expressing Christ means, how are you today? Have you met Jesus lately? Have you experienced His power and His saving grace? Have you experienced the washing and cleansing of the power of the name of Jesus? Have you experienced what He wants to do in your life? Why? Because that's what He's doing. He's wanting to touch every single person. You see, who, who will... Allow those riches to increase and increase and increase in their lives. You see, will you allow your riches to increase by putting them to work or will you bury them? Will you take what God's done for you and bury it? It's plain. 
Jesus saved you. Jesus cleansed you. Jesus turned your life around. Let's hide it. Now there's the talent. And that's what he was talking about. You see, I believe whenever you look at that, the more I express Christ, <laughs> the one hid, right? But what did he say to the ten? I'm going to take from over here and I'm going to give to here. Why? Because I believe if we begin to reach and we get the expressions of Christ in our life, that He's going to be looking for Him to be able to do even more within our life. You see, God prepared and designed His redemptive work uh, to, for us to, to cause us to want to do good works. Good works does not save us alone. Salvation comes from God alone. It's not ours. But God's, God's new creation demands Good works. You see, these good works are the crowning result of God's salvation in our life. Good works are not the cause of salvation. Catch this. They're not the cause of salvation. They are the fruit. If the world is ever going to know Jesus is Lord, then they must be able, we must be able to carry the gospel to them and preach to them the word of truth. You see, the, the church must preach truth. Hearing the truth will be convicting to sinners. They will repent and they will believe the gospel. They will hear and they will be convicted. They will be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see, this is God's method in the historical account we know shows time and time again in New Testament Scripture. Jesus refers to Himself in John 14 as the truth. And preaching Jesus is the only truth or gospel that can save people from their sins. 1 Corinthians 15 reminds us that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And only when this truth is preached will saving faith bring about the new birth experience. Every single person needs to experience a new birth. Amen. God has chosen the foolishness of preachers to save some that believe. You see, without the preached word of God, a sinner cannot hear with faith, according to Romans 10 and 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's plan is that those who are saved first hear the gospel truth from the mouth of a God sent preacher. According to Romans 10, this is how it states it, starting in verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now I'm fixing to hurt us generations of Pentecost again. Have we lost the excitement of being preached to? We might have if we haven't tried to bring someone to hear the right. priest's word. Right. The preacher has lost his impact. Right. That's another generational curse. You see, preaching is still God's method of presenting the gospel of salvation to the lost. And preaching must come from the word of truth and the gospel of salvation. Ephesians 1 and 13. God's work of redemption is a finished work, but His purpose also includes the unfinished task of restoring dignity and dominion to humanity. God has promised to work in us what is well-pleasing in His sight. Experiencing this resurrection power is a prelude to the total restoration of all things. As a church, do we really believe in our riches in Christ. I mean, if we're really rich in Christ, you know, you know, you know, truly, truly, truly rich people, and not those fakes, foes, and phonies, you know, likes trying to be somebody's. 
but, but really rich people. You see them quite often. Giving it away. Are you catching this? Giving it away. Get, they, they've, got, they've got a bunch of money and they, they, they give to these charities and they give to these things. They, get, they give to this. You say they're just trying to get a big name. doesn't matter. They're constantly... You see those that are really really have a lot of money. Quite often they're giving it away. So I wonder if that marks us as Christians. Those that are really rich... Are always giving it away. Come on. Yes. Good. Think on that for a moment. If you hadn't gave any away lately, yeah. it's not because he's not rich. Yeah. It's because we don't feel rich. See, she went away alone one day from that well, or she went alone to the well that day. And she, she had done so quite often. You see, this woman of Samaria had had many companions and those that appeared to uh, really be a, a few friends. An outcast, quite possibly, from the polite society. She wasn't found at the normal times of the day at the well. She was there at midday, the hottest part of the day. Not the normal time to go and draw water. She was sure to be able to slip in all alone, not make big waves, get in, get some water, get out. Yet she was not alone on this occasion, for there was a man that was sitting by the well. Jesus was passing through Samaria, and he stopped by Jacob's well. He sent his disciples out to search for food. They probably wasn't rich enough. Let that, Amen. Let that sink in a minute. And so he sent them away to get their food. Conversation unfolded and Jesus had a way of, of cutting through all of those, uh, those things that we, we throw up as our facades and pretenses and all. And the woman was, was, uh, was questioning his statements about living water and the differences of, of Jews and Samaritans and, you know, all those kind of things. We come up with all those small talk questions and like throwing all those things up. But things change quickly whenever Jesus just began to expose the secrets of her heart. There, he unfolded. She had been married five times and she was not married to the partner she had at the moment. Not, no wondering about the, uh, the town. No, no wonder she was not really wanting to be there in the main highlight of the day getting water with everyone else. You see, she might have, she might have wondered, how could this man know so much about me? How could he have so much insight into this my life. In the last attempt of his deflection of statement, she said, you know, Messiah, he's going to sort things out whenever he comes. And he there made this very powerful statement, John 4 and 26, I that speak unto thee am he. The woman let her water pot tumble to the ground. You know, one of those most important things to them in that day was to keep that water pot. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, the water pot was not very important. And she rushed back to town, and this woman who had been avoiding everybody. Come on. You thought about that for a moment? She's there at the hottest part of the day, at midday. She didn't want to be seen by anybody. She drops her water pot and runs back to everybody. It's there that she, she rushes back and avoiding, after having avoided all these people, what can account for that change? Because she met the Messiah and encountered and changed her life. Jesus stayed in that town for those two days and many people believed in Him. They, they had such uh, a great uh, overwhelming 
testimony that had been given by this woman, she could not help but share the blessings of her salvation. Today, I tell you as the people of God, God's done so much in our life. Will we drop our water pots of our life and say, you know what? If there's an opportunity to be to share Jesus, Amen. what takes the priority? Right. A water pot or the gospel message? Yep. As the people of God, we're in a hurting world. We're in a hurting time. If there's ever been a time that we need to be sharing the riches that we have, sharing this beautiful story of Jesus Christ, I want you to know today, He loves us. He's given us a rich inheritance. And I want us to do our very best to share that inheritance. Amen. Sometimes we get worried that we will throw all of our inheritance away. I can assure you this. If you're giving away Jesus, there's always much more. If you're giving away Jesus, you're not going to run out. And we ask the Lord to help us tonight. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the riches that you have bestowed upon us. For Lord Jesus, truly we are rich in many blessings. We ask you, God, to touch us and help us, Lord. We want to be able to share what you have done. We want to be able to share, Lord, your blessings in our life. Convict our hearts, O oh God. Help us, Jesus, to be more involved in your gospel message. Help us to share your love every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We appreciate you. I want you to remember that this Sunday is our last day for our um, uh, rows of sharing donations out in the, out in the uh, outside there. The box is filling up. And, uh, and so uh, if you can, uh, we'll send a reminder out before Sunday for you to grab a few cans and, uh, and bring. And let's be a blessing to some of those in need. And uh, it's totally okay for you to pray over those cans when you put them in there and say, Lord, whoever takes, partakes of this, we pray, God, that you would touch them, help them, reveal Jesus into their life. Amen. God bless you. We appreciate you. Hope you have a very great evening. Saturday. get a few of you guys to stick around and help me. They're wanting to move chairs uh, again on this portion of the building for, uh, for uh, their Saturday event. Amen.